Fantastic. Good morning. Welcome. It's October. Um, I'm going to now commence with my uh, monthly ritual of butchering people's names and also welcoming people to the foundation. Um, one of our big announcements, we have a new VP of engineering and we'll get to spend a couple minutes with him and introduce him further and do a little bit of Q&A. In addition, we have Marty Johnson. Where's Marty? Raise your hand. There you are. Thank you for joining us in f and Bartosz in Poland, so hopefully you on. Bahadir in New York City. We've got Jeff in Virginia. And then we have some conversions that we are happy to like more permanently add to our family, which is Rachel. Where's Rachel? You all know who that was. Yay! And Joel, of course, who makes magic with our IT. And Morial and Features, who's in New York. <laughs> All right, so we've got um, a bunch of contractors, interns, and volunteers joining the foundation. So we have Blaine and Legal. Blaine, where are you? Welcome to the foundation. Um, we have Paul Campbell in recruiting, who's over there, so he'll be helping out. Um, we have Sadie in grant making. Where's Sadie? She's here. There you are. Welcome. Um, Camille in Legal. Camille Ram, not saying her. Shayla in communications, anywhere? <laughs> we have Jake in grant making. Where's Jake? I've been there on the office a couple days ago. All right. Uh, Alex in grant making. Where's Alex? No. And Athena in F and A. Is Athena here? All right. Um, so, again, seeing all these folks around, say hello. And then we have a whole bunch of finance fellows joining the organization. So we have, is it Lena or Lean? Lena. All right, we have Lena and Walter and Sei and Arda. So if you guys could all raise your hands. Yay, welcome to the foundation. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Lila so she can introduce Damon, and then we'll do a little bit of a Q&A. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am very, very excited today, and I hope you are excited as well. I think especially those of you who are in engineering. We've been doing this search for a very, very long time, and um, it's, been, uh, it's been a very, very long process. And first of all, I'm very, very grateful to Eric and Gail, but the rest of the executive team, our recruiting team for helping with this. And for all of you and product and engineering that spend countless hours uh, working with us, interviewing, reviewing, um, and doing all kinds of uh, work to help us find the right person. And as you all know, it's not easy to find the right person for us, both because of who we are how we work, and um, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'm extremely excited. For those of you who have not met Damon, introduce Damon Sikor, who, is, uh, who started this Monday. Come on on. <laughs> Hi. Damon is a very, very special person. Um, aside from him being um, a stellar engineering uh, leader in the, uh, in the valley and in the world, I have to tell you, I've done a ton of background checks that he didn't, uh, for people who he didn't give me names for, I could not, I could not find a single person to say something negative about him, and I asked. <laughs> I, de I dug deep and I cast my web wide to do this due diligence. Um, but uh, everybody that he's worked for, uh, with have incredibly high opinion of uh, and, and high respect for Damon. Um, but what's really, really important for us is that Damon brings not just the level of expertise that we need to run our engineering practices, but he also brings the passion the spirit and the open source background that is really, really important in our organization. And I'm really excited about that piece. So with that, I want to open it up for Damon to say a couple of words about himself. Hi, everybody. 
<clears throat> first, I want to say I'm incredibly honored to be here. Um, this uh, project is probably, in, in, in my life, probably one of the most important things I could possibly work on. The reason I say that is when, when I graduated from, from computer science at Texas A&M, I had no idea that I would be in a project like this affecting this many people, um, working with such an incredible team in an open source project. So first, just thank you and to all the executive staff, to Lila, to Gail, and to everybody who worked so hard, to Eric, um, to, to really bring me on board. Um, but most important, I want to thank the community. Um, the community, I don't mean just the Wikimedia community, but all the communities I work with in the past from an open source perspective. That like, goes back to like, way back in subversion days, I think I contributed to that somewhere. And, um, and working at Red Hat and JBoss and then, of course, Mozilla and all the work I did at Firefox, I want to thank everybody that helped me along the way. It's really about the team. It's not about me. It's about all the work that they did to keep the open web open and to fight for using sovereignty. And that's, that's really why I'm here is I want to continue that effort. And for those of you who have not read Damon's big background, uh, he's been at multiple open source companies and he's contributed to many open source projects. Uh, JBoss uh, is one of them. Um, he spent six years at Mozilla, um, half of that, over half of that, running all of the engineering there. Um, that went from about 27 to 600, is that 27 right? 27 to 600, yeah. There are about 1,100 people at Mozilla now. Uh, and uh, some of the largest releases of the browser were shipped under his watch, as well as the I, uh, their first uh, launch of the mobile platforms. So I'm going to lobby a few questions, and then I'm going to open it up for people to ask additional ones. I thought I'd start, but given your background, um, what are some of the things that you're most proud of? Um, I'd probably say the security stuff that I've done on the web. Mm -hmm. um, Firefox, I don't remember if it was Firefox 4, I actually don't remember which version it was, but one of them was uh, we shipped zero security, critical security bugs in the browser. And for a long time it was about 160 bugs were kind of floating around in the browser, and these are critical bugs where they could take over your browser, they could take over your entire operating system and steal all your contacts, any data you want. And um, so I decided that, you know, that's just not acceptable. And so I drove that number down to zero. And so we had a, a release that had zero security bugs, which, well, mediums were in there too, but nothing high, which was a, a big achievement for us. Nobody had ever done that before at Mozilla. Very cool. You've been with us now a whole four days. <laughs> I would love to just have a sense of what your first impressions are and some of the things that you've been thinking about the last couple of days. Um, well, I'm actually overwhelmed by the team. Uh, everybody was super warm and welcoming. Um, the first experience I had was actually on IRC. Mm -hmm. I lurked for a long time. Uh, that's kind of what I do. I mean, um, joining open source projects, I kind of came in through a lot of different avenues, be it through the bug system or through IRC or sort of just reaching out to individual community members. But with, um, with MediaWiki or Wikipedia in general or uh, Wikimedia, they were very friendly and, out, and, and outgoing. Mm -hmm. um, I immediately got responses in IRC, and responsiveness on open source projects is really critical. Mm -hmm. Being able to be responsive to your to your, your community is going to be something that's going to determine your success overall. Mm -hmm. And so I was very impressed with the responsiveness of the teams overall, and every, and every community member it was very positive. Um, also, uh, on my first day, uh, one of the things we did, <laughs> I was kind of shocked. We were looking at... Uh, the communications uh, around the Ebola crisis, right, mm -hmm. and how we can optimize that. And that just on the first day was just mind-blowing. Yeah. And that is something that really got me excited. In fact, uh, when I got home, my son said, uh, it was on the third day, it was last night, he said, he said, Dad, you look kind of just like Jolene, who's my three-year-old daughter. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you look just like Jolene when she, she, when she sees chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> when you come home, it's just like, this is your, this is your dream job, right, David? And yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So it very much is my dream job. Um, and, and I'm very excited to, to, to get to work with all of you because um, the interactions I've had in the first meetings have been overwhelming. So um, one of the reasons that you, we brought you on is for your leadership capabilities. And I'm curious to hear from you um, in that particular arena, what are some of the leadership principles and practices that you most embody, aspire, hold in yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in honesty and courage. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of courageous conversations with, uh, with individuals. The reason I do that is because I want to inherently support them and, and make people successful. Um, so from a leadership perspective, it's making people successful. That, that's really what I want to do. Um, other things uh, around, like I always often say integrity. I always like to try to do the right thing. 
but often it's hard to know what to do the right thing is, mm -hmm. right? So, but I, I hold that very, very close to my heart, which is like, no matter what, I'm always going to treat you with respect and with dignity, and I want to treat the teams fairly, and I want to find ways to, to enhance uh, uh, their experience in their lives in mm -hmm. a positive way. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to the floor and also to IRC, so we'll keep an eye out on both, and we've got a couple mics running around, so if you're curious or have something top of mind that you'd like to ask, feel free. By the way, I'm, I'm really used to IRC questions. We did it all the time at Mozilla. Mm -hmm. We've got some IRC lurking here. Come on, don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> Ask me a really hard question. Like, Here's a softball. <laughs> Let's give you a softball. Uh, I'm going to try and phrase this as a community member. <laughs> Given that you have next to or nearly invisible edits on the projects, how is it that you think that you might be able to come into our organization and run it? <laughs> Well, I'm not planning on running the entire organization. That's nice. Um, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Well, you know, I'm not entirely uh, uh, unaware of wiki technologies. Um, actually, one of the things I did early on was implement a wiki, and I used a lot of the wiki text uh, that was at least at that time it was in MediaWiki as sort of like a guiding uh, principle of like how I would implement my own wiki. Um, that said, what I really care about, not necessarily is, 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 is the actual thing that is a wiki, but I care about language and words and giving a voice to people. And that is something that I spent my entire life doing is trying to understand how to communicate and also um, give people a platform so that they feel like they are empowered and enabled to do the things that they want to do. So I feel that all the work that I've done in open source and in building dynamic teams that can build software that can enable things like MediaWiki, that uh, we, can, we can reach our goals if, if we focus on the right things and we deliver the software that uh, people expect from us and we set expectations accordingly and we deliver on those expectations. So we've got a couple questions, um, a fun one, and then a slightly more serious one. The fun one is from Victor, who asks that you, he's heard that you have a really neat car and wants to know if it's a lowrider. It's true. I do have a lowrider. Background <laughs> check. I, there was I nothing the background check. It's, yeah. it's right now, it's uh, covered in leaves. Um, it's sitting in my driveway. It is, a, it is a 1969 Galaxy 500. Yes, it's blue, convertible, dropped. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> And um, and I will have to look up what a lowrider is. Um, a more, <laughs> more serious question. Um, there are plans for an engineering reorg. Is there a timeline on that now or coming up soon? Uh, yes, it's in two hours. OK. <laughs> no, actually, I'm, I'm kidding on that. Um, we are actually talking about uh, reorg stuff. There, um, it's not necessarily something you need to be worried about in the sense of like, oh my god, reorg. Um, but there are changes in people coming and going. And so we're looking at um, optimum balance of teams, uh, looking at resource management in general, making sure that people aren't overloaded, specifically managers. Um, it's not about, uh, at least the org changes that I've heard so far. And I haven't, again, it's like, was it day three, four? <laughs> um, I don't know all the details, so I can't tell you what the reorg is going to, to be or if there is going to be a reorg or it's going to be massive or anything like that. But again, don't freak out. People always panic about this stuff. But in any case, um, we are looking at how we're going to rebalance some, some teams to make sure that people are most effective and that managers are not losing their minds. Um, because right now, when I look at the balance, uh, it's like we have 25 people per manager. And knowing like how I operate, I, I, right, I really like to spend a lot of time with people. And around 8 or 9 is where I start to peak out. Um, and so 25 people, we're not giving people the attention that they need and um, deserve as just employees, period. So I want to make sure that everybody gets the attention they need so that they can all be successful. And that means we got to make sure that uh, we, we, we balance our loads appropriately amongst managers. Thank you. James, is there any other questions in the room, too? Because I know there are some in IRC. All right. Over to you. Uh, 
no serious questions yet. On ILC. <laughs> I, I can ask non-serious questions, like, are we going to rewrite uh, MediaWiki into Rust? Um, Brendan would love that. Also, questions about the dude. Uh, OK. Uh, I have no plans in rewriting MediaWiki in any other language at this point. Excellent. I'll, I'll, I'll take suggestions. All right. Yes, right here. So how is the handoff process from Eric to you is going to happen? Um, well, Eric and I have been meeting to just talk about individual people and groups and overall goals and deliverables that they've been ex communicated so far and decided upon. Um, the handoff is is pretty straightforward. Um, essentially, we talk to the, the directors and the teams and individuals who are on my teams or projected to be on my teams, and then we just make the move and we have we sit down with everybody and we, we talk about what people want to do and what's important to them. And I'm a very inclusive manager. In other words, I'm not going to force people into an org change or sort of a structure that doesn't make sense. I'm going to listen and I'm going to say, oh, you don't want to do that? Fine, we won't. We'll, we'll do something different because we want to achieve X, Y, and Z. Um, so the handoff itself will be simply, I don't know if there is a, sp a specific schedule, but I kind of want it to be just sort of as quick as possible and we just get right to work. I mean, that's really the most important thing. So logistically, the handoff is already uh, underway and pretty much um, happened as of, as of Monday, uh, name and runs engineering. However, there is a, um, a structural uh, piece of this, like things like approvals uh, are still going to Eric, and that's happening until next week. And next week, Damon's going to take over all of the organizational duties or um, what would you call them? Um, paperwork duties as well, basically. So it's very rapid operational duties. Thank you uh, as well. So it's it's a very rapid handoff. That said, you know, guys, how everything works around here, right? We support each other, and we'll uh, take some time, you know, for um, that. Eric and, and Damon are going to work together, and Eric is going to give uh, Damon the support that he needs to make sure that he has information in his hands. I expect that we'll, we'll be joined at the hip in practice for a while. And uh, Damon has been sitting in on, on the quarterly reviews and uh, getting immersed in what the teams are actually doing. Uh, he's sitting right across from me, so uh, anytime he has a question, he can yell at me. We both have standing desks, so we can uh, directly yell at each other, even though he's way taller than me. <laughs> So yeah, it, it, it should be pretty straightforward in terms of making sure that any anything that needs clarification gets clarification quickly. Um, he's taking over full management and approvals uh, responsibilities effective next week. So I'll be in Berlin, so he gets a little bit of a alone time in the office to figure stuff out. Yeah. And uh, and then after that, um, I'll be helping more in person um, to provide orientation and guidance as needed. Also, too, I, I, don't, I don't really think of this as kind of like a handoff as much as an integration kind of a thing. Um, engineering and product need to be joined at the hip all the time anyway, kind of sitting down in the trenches working together. Um, so we, there's the handoff is really sort of just a, a formality more than anything else because this is all about uh, working together. Let's take a couple more questions. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Dario. Yeah, so um, I have a question about... Uh, your thoughts on organizational layout. Um, we've had some pretty massive proposals to reorganize uh, engineering and product, uh, um, uh, the, the identity of individual teams, uh, whether it should be more fluid. So I imagine that Mozilla cannot, I mean, by scale, cannot be directly compared with, with media. But I, I was curious if you had any thoughts about uh, uh, things that work well in terms of organizational structure at Mozilla. Yeah, I had a principle at, at, at uh, Mozilla just keeping things as really as flat as possible. Um, what I like to do is look for leaders within the engineering community, since engineering is my focus, that have demonstrated the ability to reach out and leverage other people um, in at scale, right? And that means as an engineer, and I, I really look for engineering directors more than anything else. Managers themselves, I think they kind of cause actions to happen inside the open source community just by just driving things, being energized and, and having an idea and finding the most appropriate engineer to really hammer something home. So I like those teams to build them to grow organically as they like to grow. And that's something that I'll just, I'll put them, it's like, like a, I want to create a petri dish for great engineering teams, right? And I'm not going to dictate how that goes. 
What I want to do though is again keep things flat as possible, keep low on uh, a low load on managers and low load on engineers, and uh, and make sure that we are capable of winning every time we ship a product. And that means we ship on time and we ship on high quality and we ship the features that uh, we said we were going to ship. Um, so that means our teams and structures have to reflect uh, the ability to do that. Hey, um, there's a very uh, untimely question of the, so how do you intend to work with community to communicate better about when we develop, deploy, and how and when? And kind of tangentially related to that, are you aware that we're deploying code right now? <laughs> um, I hope we're deploying code right now. Um, I would consider it a failure for not deploying code all the time. Um, how do I, I think it's a strange uh, question to, ha to ask me how will I work with the community because I actually don't think of it as any other way. Um, and it, it sort of assumes that there's a negative there. <laughs> um, and I, I don't, I don't I, we, I have to be where my users are. I have to be where my engineers are. And if that means it's an IRC, if it's a mailing list, if it's uh, wherever they are. And that means I'm going to engage with them at the, using the mechanisms that they use. Uh, so I don't consider myself any separate, any, in any way different from the community or, or separate from it. Um, we are the community. We are here. And in fact, I don't even really like the term community. I like to think of it as, as we are partners and, and teammates in this stuff. Um, community is, is a concept that I think we use overall for entirely, like to describe large open source projects. You know, this is our community. But when I sit down in a meeting, I don't think of like, oh, how do I give this to the community? Because it doesn't make sense. It was like, we are the community. We are doing this in the community. So by saying that, how am I going to be better, interacting better with the community is almost implying that I'm not doing it by default. Uh, Mike? OK. Uh, as a technical leader, are you going to uh, try to give some of your time to doing technical work yourself? Or do you see yourself mostly as a, a people manager? I see myself mostly as a leader and a people manager, not a technical person. Um, although th I do have a lot of technical skills. Uh, in uh, my experience at Mozilla, having to deal with uh, the JavaScript engine and how to um, optimize language performance and kind of knowing the, high, the, the concepts that are very relevant to deep uh, technology inside of a browser, that, that experience over the past 10 years has... Um, has enabled me to build a lot of depth in technology. However, I don't like to get down into the weeds because I find that um, the technologists that work in these projects are far better at it than I am, and I'd rather rely on their, their, their knowledge. Uh, welcome. Uh, how can we help? Like, What can we do in the foundation, in the community, to, to help you get up to speed and help you? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, the first thing you can do is talk to me. <laughs> um, please just stop by my desk and say hi. Drop me emails. A lot of people have been doing that already. Um, point me at wiki pages. Uh, point me at forums. Point me at mailing lists. Um, oh, the other thing too is that uh, since I've got, I've been, I subscribe to what ten new mailing lists, and I think I have two thousand messages in my first two days. Okay, <laughs> literally two thousand messages. All right. So um, what I find really difficult about mailing lists, and I think it's just this is the way it is, is that often you can't find um, when people are trying to reach you, right? Um, especially when you got 2,000 messages. So if, if you see that I'm not responding to a thread, just, just come tap me on the shoulder. Hey, look, they're, they're talking about you over here, okay? And then that way I can at least go read it and find out some stuff there. That really, really helps. It helps me, helps introduce me into to, to new places where I can find new information about projects, right? And that's, that's very helpful. Thanks. So um, from my perspective, my VP is remaining the same. I'm a product manager. So what can the product team do to, su to help support you specifically since we're not like directly in your management group? I think that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to be spending a lot of time with you. <laughs> um, what I really want to, to, to really see um, from product managers is a sense or a real understanding of the data around their products and features. Um, I'm, I'm a data person. I like to, to know what's working and what's not. Um, I, my opinion is if we're not measuring it, we don't know what we're shipping, right? So I'm going to be asking hard questions around uh, uh, how do we know what we're shipping, uh, and that's where I want uh, the, the product management team to really just step up and say, hey, this is what we need to do to win. We're going to need to start wrapping up. 
Ja. Hi. <laughs> well, I'll just shout. Oh, um, so uh, I really like to hear that uh, that you see your mission as partly giving people a voice. And I was wondering if you wanted to share a story about um, social or cultural work you've done that that ex exemplifies this. Can you give me an example of what you mean? I'm not quite uh, sure. I thought. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I misheard you. I thought you were saying um, you see your mission as giving other people a voice. Yeah. If you want to give examples. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, giving other people a voice. Well, the browser itself was a, a platform to give people a voice. Like you couldn't, if you can't get to Wikipedia unless you go through a browser now. At least, well, until there was mobile phones and cell phones, right? So, um, the things that really energized me when I was at Mozilla was around the the, the things that really affected people's lives the most, and um, security. Like I said before, was one of the one of the big aspects of that. But also just features on the web, making it a performant browser. Uh, making it accessible. We started an accessibility team, hired 10 people to do um, alternative forms of input for you know um, challenged uh, individuals. And that, to me, was um, creating a platform for people to access the web, right? And that's that's what I mean by giving them a voice more than anything else, is making it easy for them to find the information they need, but yet make their lives better, right? And um, Wikipedia, it is history, right? And people need to have a voice to record history. And that's what we need to build. Um, I want to add to that now that we're um, as we're wrapping up. Um, when I was talking to people who I knew Damon from his previous experiences, his previous jobs, and especially those people who reported to him, actually brought up this point of him giving them a voice and uh, really supporting them through their careers and through their growth uh, and uh, through their visions of themselves. Um, and that came out really loud and clear. It was it was almost funny. People would just uh, would come out and say, this is the best boss I ever had. <laughs> and, Thank you. Uh, um, and I think that's part of giving giving somebody a voice is uh, giving them support to do to really shine to do what they do best. And we all are talented in different ways. I think the trick here uh, in a good leader and a great manager is to recognize what your particular talent is, support it, and give you the freedom to fly with it. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that happen here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. On back to you for a quick exact update. Oh, really, really quick. Yes. yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be really brief. Hang on, give me a second. The slide is very bright. So um, about three months ago, um, I stood here in front of you and I said, as the executive team, we had two things that we wanted to work through uh, that quarter, or at least uh, start that quarter. I always saw them as gaps. One is uh, one was our um, uh, lack of clarity around the strategy for the next um, for the next few years, decade. And uh, another one was how exactly our methodology around execution, how do we measure our own performance. So I wanted to give you a very brief update today on where we are and what the next steps are. So let's start with the strategy. So remember that what we are, what strategy conversation really gives us is a context for where the world around us is going because we don't live or exist in a vacuum. Um, what is it answers the question of what our place, the WMF, uh, as an organization, uh, what is our place in that world, and uh, finally some parameters around setting setting out some parameters about how to get there. And this is the work that we have started. We started initially doing this internally. We started this brainstorming. So what we've done is we did some preliminary analysis around uh, SWOT. For those of you who are not familiar, it's identifying what our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are. So thinking about the context, the context in which we exist. Um, identifying what our core, what are we really good at? What is our unique core competencies that nobody else out there may have? And visioning the world that's going to exist in the next decade. And we first started doing that as a very small core team, just a few people, a couple of us from the executive team, a couple of us from different teams around um, 
uh, around the organization. And we opened it up to all of the uh, senior managers, directors, and we gathered a lot of feedback. We're in the process of incorporating this feedback and uh, sending it out back to uh, all of you, actually letting you know where we are. So what's next? The so next thing that we're going to do, this is uh, part of our process, is launch a community consultation. So open this conversation up to our um, to anybody who actually cares or wants to have that conversation, and especially in the context of what is the future of Wikimedia, um, what what will the world look like in the next 10 years and 20, 20 or so, and how do we fit in that world? Because that's the, that's the context that will really help us. Those are the ideas that we need to be aware of, because it's really, we, we are... 200, right? Uh, we are very, um, we, we talk to each other and we give each other ideas, but what we can really do is bring ideas that are out there from every corner in the world and listen to them. That will really help guide us. And then once we have that, what we're going to do is we're going to basically digest that, um, review that, try to filter out um, the most core uh, part uh, parts of those of that commentary and come back with an update to a vision and direction in the form of a direction statement. Make sense? So uh, at the end, what we're going to come out of this process with are the strategy deliverables. I don't want to remind you that strategy is an ongoing recursive process, right? It's like if, for those of you technical recursive algorithm, right? We're going to keep reevaluating it. We're not going to do this set the strategy for five years, goals, and then just march to it um, in, uh, uh, in the linear direction. We're going to keep looking at it because the world is changing, we're changing, we're finding new things. So it's going to be public, participat participatory, and most importantly, an ongoing process. Okay? We're going to come out with a statement of direction that um, it's going to be an initial statement, and again, that's going to be revisited at you know, maybe once a year or so, uh, we're going to have an updated scorecard. This is where we're going into the execution. This is how we measure our success on the path to the direction that we're setting. And then finally, again, we're going to repeat, rinse and repeat. Uh, so this, uh, right now, there's a big push towards it because this is the first time we're setting up this framework and the structure, but it should turn into a process machine. Okay. Next. So this is around strategy. If you have any questions, we don't have time for Q&A today, but you, you know how to reach me, just shoot me an email. So the second thing that we did is we said, OK, uh, let's be, it's really important that we have accountability authority and we're monitoring how well we do. So this is a sample. Um, don't, don't get hung up, don't, don't get hung, hung up on the wording in there. So basically we said, OK, we're going to come up with the top objectives for every department. We're going to color code them to see if, how we're doing. And in the next couple of weeks, all of the departments are due to come back with the scorecard and basically say, OK, we promised this. This is where we are today. And I'll be able to tell you probably in the next meeting how, how well we did, you know, what kind of, uh, um, how much was achieved. Did we, are we mostly green? Are we like in the A zone or in the C zone? And the, the, the reason I, we started doing this is just to set a baseline to see how well do we, um, do we do against what we say we're going to do. So it's just kind of a fundamental first thing to do. So let's go next. So uh, the next thing that we're working on as we're doing this and as we're improving this is uh, uh, thinking cross-functionally. And I already see this happening in the last three months. So many conversations are happening between department. And people are collaborating. And I'm extremely excited to see that. I have to give you big props and big thanks for stepping up. And this is, to me, this is the essence of open source culture. When people just run with, with, the, with, with the ideas, they step up and they start driving things. So I have to thank you for that. And please don't stop. Please continue. Um, you show your leadership ability no matter where you are within the organization by making uh, by, by driving things like that. So I'm seeing not only cross-functional work within the product and engineering state team, but I see I see uh, I see folks in uh, grant making reaching out to other departments. I see uh, folks in Wikipedia Zero reaching out and and, and trying to work uh, cross-functionally. If we do that, we'll have so much more impact than if we work in isolation. 
uh, we're going to continue to standardize the measurements uh, and eventually come out with that, with the scorecard, um, which we expect sometimes in, uh, in, in Q3. We're going to clarify roles and responsibilities, continue to clarify roles and responsibilities. Again, it's really hard to um, hold somebody accountable if you don't know who is accountable, right? So that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, a really big item on uh, our agenda is to document product design and development process. Because we're an open organization, because we operate, we don't operate in a vacuum, this is a huge thing for us to do. We need to decide what, does it, what are the steps uh, in the process development and at those steps what things need to happen and then finally go beyond the transparency and transparency is great it's fundamental but we need to have clarity communication and results that's what transparency is un underlying but unless we get to those uh, to, to those things then transparency in and of itself is not is, is not giving us what what we want from it so again, with all of this, um, with all of this said, I think it's uh, one thing that I want to say is thank all of you. As I'm going through the reviews, I already see the difference between this quarter and last quarter around how you're thinking. And I want to continue to encourage you to think that way, using the data, using the, the, the reality to tell us where we should be going next looking at where we're strong and where we're weaker, right? and really starting to pay attention and, and attack those, stepping in as leaders at every level in the organization and really attacking those pain points. Thank you for doing that. And it's really important that you feel supported by us as well in order to do, to do the work that you do. So please don't hesitate and ask for the support that you need. We are here to support you just as well as you are here to support our communities and support our users. So thank you. Thank you, Lila. Right. Um, the next thing in the agenda are the, the top line metrics. I'll invite you to take a look yourself if you want. Um, the only thing on that is worth calling out um, as far as like the overall content and community transfer are concerned are the uh, uh, Wiki Loves Monuments numbers, which we'll see soon for September. Um, but other than that, active editors have been flat through the last month. Um, but I will um, also uh, say that this is probably the last time that I'm opening this tab in my browser at this meeting. Um, at all, um, because the uh, uh, the analytics team has been working on a completely new dashboard system. So say goodbye to the monthly report card as you know it, um, and um, we'll give an overview. <laughs> we will still call it the monthly metrics meeting. We'll just show different metrics, Brandon. Thank you. Or no metrics. <laughs> no, we'll still show metrics, Brandon. Or. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, take a look yourself if you want, and, and we'll show you the uh, the new metrics uh, dashboard in a bit. Um, and the next presentation and the agenda is an update on individual grant making by SIC. Great, thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, Seek Bouters from Individual Engagement Grants. Uh, Lila's point around cross-department collaboration and also collaboration between foundation staffers and the community is sort of a nice segue here. Uh, this grant program basically supports community members to run and lead new experimental projects for six months aimed at uh, improving one or more Wikimedia project. They're doing research, uh, they're building tools, they're leading community organizing efforts, and they're doing outreach. Uh, so we just got through a new proposal drive, and now we're at the point where we get to decide which community projects are we going to fund. It's a little bit like Christmas. So September, we started just running out there and sourcing proposals from various, uh, you know, various community members around the world. Um, and we also made some upgrades to the tools that people use to do this. So on the left of the screen, you can see the old proposal creation experience. Looks fun, right? Wiki markup, uh, pretending to be a form. Uh, so we built a little gadget, it's called the Form Wizard. You can see what that experience looks and feels like uh, over here instead. It's a lot cleaner. We beta tested it, 
which means that we offered people actually both choices because we figured we'd find a lot of bugs in this wizard, and of course, indeed, we did. Uh, so some proposals got created the new way, some got created the old way. But as an outcome of that September drive, uh, you can see we had you know, a bunch of new ideas and drafts that got created. The total ask is about a half a million dollars. And most importantly, we now have 37 new projects to choose from. Uh, and there's a, about a 50% increase from the, the past drives that we've done. So we do think that that new form wizard has, has been you know, lowering one barrier to entry for folks to get in here. Just to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the kinds of proposals that we're looking at now, um, I've tossed up a few examples here. We have uh, folks who want to continue to build their network for the art and feminism edit-a-thons that they've been doing, content to uh, decrease the gender gap. We've got a project on the table to lead some research around what works with wiki projects and then expand that across to more wiki projects. Um, I'm seeing a lot around micro contributions and a lot around wiki source this round, which is kind of fun. Uh, so we've got one proposal here aimed at uh, improving tools for Tomal wiki source. And then we've got um, a proposal on the table to basically start to play with the model that Magnus has put forth with the wiki data game, micro contributions for Wikipedia. And he's thinking mobile first, which is kind of fun. What happens next from all of these is we go through and do some basic eligibility checks. We start to sort them into groups. Um, and then community comments. So how do we decide on these proposals? We decide with a lot of input from all of you. Um, and after the last round of IEG, we were sort of wondering, like, what motivates people to come and comment on these proposals? You know, why would you come spend your spare time doing this? Uh, so we put out a little survey and uh, got back just a bit of information from those who responded. And indeed, it's not hugely surprising, right? What motivates people is an interest in the impact that these projects can have on their home wikis, on areas that they work on or are interested in, um, right? You have a connection with the ideas. I bet that you guys all have a connection with these ideas too. And Guess what? We're all part of the community. So um, right now, during the comments period, we're hoping that you guys will come and share your expertise. We built another little tool that we're trying out this round. Um, it's called the Add Me Gadget. So if you go to the IEG page, you'll see a link of a whole bunch of proposals that we're considering right now. Next week, that that list will be more nicely formatted and separated out. So if you just want to comment on, say, research proposals or tools proposals, you'll be able to do that. Um, but once you go to a proposal page, we've got a few little calls to action. You can give feedback, which is basically just you know post your thoughts on the talk page, give people advice or suggestions for how they should be thinking about these things. Um, you can endorse it if you think it's a really awesome idea that we should absolutely fund. Please go ahead and endorse. And then you can also join a project. Um, lots of projects are looking for more volunteers to get involved, or they're looking for advisors. I serve as an advisor on some projects that um, you know, are within sort of an area of expertise that I have. Others on staff do as well. Lots of community members do. And you know, people are welcome to contribute in that way. If you're interested in either of the two gadgets that we built, we built them in a way that they're flexible and can be used outside of grant making. So uh, those are some links to the documentation. Um, and then in terms of passing around a little bit of wiki love for making this round possible, my gadget co-conspirators, the Idea Lab team, Jonathan Morgan, Jeff Paul, and Heather Walls put a lot of time and energy into that this round. Um, Haitham Shema did a bunch of work analyzing the sort of the um, the outcomes of the past round, and we've used that uh, to roll into this new round. Open call messaging, Patrick Early and Okasi both helped sort of nudge people in the gates and then into completing proposals. Um, and then finally, to all the community members, again, including you, who were bold enough to both share ideas for new projects um, and then also start giving feedback on them. Any questions? What, is the current, what are the current leaders? The, the current leaders, like the, the best ones? Mm, it is too early to say because we have just started the comments period. So all of the proposals got finalized the day before yesterday, um, and many of them come in at the 11th hour. So I don't pick winners yet. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's early days. Um, so I think we'll be better placed to answer that question two weeks from now. Mike, please. Hello. Yes. What is the largest proposal by amount? So we cap these grants at thirty thousand, and we do indeed have one request for thirty thousand. Most of them are closer to the ten to fifteen thousand range. Other questions? Otherwise, we have another grant making presentation. How do we advertise this? How do we advertise the community comments period or uh, uh, request for proposals? The request for proposals. So this round we advertise it in a few ways. One, we use mass message to go out and post to you know 500 plus village pumps. Uh, two, we went out on the mailing list and uh, we put out blog posts, social media posts, and then word of mouth is sort of the last phase, right? Like asking folks to spread the word that way. We did not run banners, and I know you and I have talked about that, and uh, now that I know that we can target banners to logged in users with a certain number of edits, I think we'll probably play with that last round. Um, in the past when we have ran them targeting just logged in users, we got a really high proportion of stuff that was just sort of needed to be filtered out. Um, and so that's kind of the concern is figuring out how to calibrate there. Um, just one comment. If you're looking at, like, for future targeting, um, you may want to consider uh, university IP addresses uh, when targeting to show the banner. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, we got to keep moving. Uh, I think we have one more presentation by Katie. Okay. I'm Katie Love, and I work on the grant making team with the Funds Dissemination Committee, who oversees the annual Plan Grants program. Okay, the, the Funds Dissemination Committee has just received 11 proposals. So these are the proposals from many of our movement organizations that get funding from the movement to do awesome movement stuff. Um, in, instead of actually tell you about some of the proposals that have come in, I have a special friend online named Jan, who is from Wikimedia Sweden, uh, who's going to tell you a little story about Wikimini and what it is and why it's cool and why you should know about it. So over to you, Jan. We can't hear you. Jan? <laughs> no, it's not. Technical difficulties. We even tested this beforehand. Okay, does anyone have any questions about what's going on in our annual plan grants world while we wait to get Jan on the line to tell you our super cool story? I can tell you we've received 11 proposals uh, for this first round of funding, and we are also launching a community review process. So if you're interested in knowing what some of our movement partners are doing, to on many of the levels that we're interested, content, participation, uh, reach, you should check out those proposals too because we'll be eagerly wanting to know your feedback on what you think. Can Go ahead, Casey. Can, sorry. can staff comment on their proposals? That is a great question. Um, I, I would recommend that you take a look, and if you feel you can give a, a good input to the process, by all means, go ahead and comment. But the FDC staff, who are me and Winifred, we really do try to consolidate all the WMF inputs, because there are several of you that will be giving explicit comments. So if you have a comment and you're not sure whether or not it would be well placed, please come to me first, and I can put it all together for our FDC staff comments all at once, rather than having potentially hundreds of us or tens of us commenting. Do you want to see if you can reach Jan later? Jan, are you there? Are we able to hear you now? Oh, dear. Jan, can you hear us? I hope you can hear me. 
<laughs> Yay, welcome. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Go ahead. So, yeah. So this is Wikimini. And Wikimini is like Wikipedia, but for kids. And when we're talking about kids here, we're meaning 8 to 13 year olds. It's hosted by Wikimedia Switzerland. And it's uh, available in Swedish and in French. Uh, uh, I hope that we soon see this in the Wikimedia family uh, hosted there instead of having it separately. Uh, we believe this is important because we get a lot of requests from teachers that who have students who have a hard time editing with a high quality standard that Wikipedia demands. But th they think that being able to share knowledge is an important life lesson that uh, you can never be too young to learn. So it's run on MediaWiki, as you sort of can tell of a few signs. And uh, here's an article about uh, the liver. I think it pops up there, yeah. Uh, and you can see like special pages and stuff like that. Uh, this was almost uh, created quite recently when around 100 students were working on articles on human organs. Um, and on the stats page on special statistics, you can see since October when we launched, over 1,000 users have signed up. And since we don't have any own stats running, we're doing it manually here. And you can see there are always around two to five classes online in editing. Uh, and this graph is showing you at least one action in the last seven days. So we think that Wikimini is is important because it gives kids an insight in collaborative work and how the web actually works. It also gives teachers that insight and perhaps they can take the step to Wikipedia later on. And these are a few of the kids of these hundred that actually was editing these organs. And I hope these will grow up to be Wikipedians one day. And if not, they are at least less available on the web. So yeah, that was a short introduction to Wikimini. Thank you, Jan. That's really cool. <laughs> Does anyone anyone have a quick question for Jan? If not, you can get in touch with me and I can reach you or I can link you directly to Jan. But Jan, thank you so much for joining and I will pass it to our next colleague. And that would be Which me. is Eric. Thank you. Thanks. So at the quarter boundary, I want us to get into the, the habit of actually doing a quick review of what we did, uh, what we said we would do, and, and what, we, uh, what we ended up doing, and what we're planning for the next quarter. So this is this. And so this is the quick summary slide, all the things that we had said are priority work for the Q1, which is July through September. And the number one priority that we had called out that is both user impacting and that also impacts our platform and our process in a pretty significant way is migrating to a new execution environment for PHP. What this basically means is making the site faster, a lot faster, especially um, for logged in users. Um, all the back end operations that are going through the PHP interpreter are going through the uh, HHVM virtual machine now, which is a lot faster. It was developed by Facebook to speed up their a massive installation that's dependent on PHP code. And we've been moving towards uh, using that as the primary uh, execution environment. Um, so it's a big performance um, related priority that's going to help our logged in user community a lot. Um, we've had the mobile apps priority to get those launched, um, to do our work around new mobile contributory workflows, to get flow out there, continued improvements to VE, single user login, you've heard updates at this meeting a couple of times already. Um, we've had a big priority on the process side around moving to a new bug tracking system and issues management system, um, and to also standardize front end libraries and MediaWiki core um, to improve metrics and dashboards, what I just talked about earlier, and the new content API that Gabriel is going to give a quick overview uh, on later in the agenda. That's a lot of stuff. Um, what you don't see here on this set of priorities is, for example, Media Viewer, which took up a ton of our collective attention in the last quarter um, as far as like responding to community concerns, running the consultation, getting out a bunch of improvements, some of which have been um, deployed this week. 
Um, so there's a ton of stuff that's not represented here. There's a lot of work that's at the infrastructure level or at the platform level that's not represented here. But these are the things that we, we called out as priorities. So if we do the fun color coding exercise as to uh, which ones got all the way through the finish line uh, in the quarter, we got the new apps fully launched. Um, and also uh, did a couple of improvement releases. If you check out the Android beta now, you see cool new features like um, nearby uh, that you can use to see stuff around you with a sort of compass-like feature of like walking around the city and uh, seeing stuff come up that's interesting. Um, so that's very, very cool. Um, we launched Visual Editor and Tablets for the mobile web, um, promoted into a stable. Um, we're experimenting with a new feature called Wikigrok that you got a preview of in uh, the previous meeting for contributing to Wikidata through the mobile web experience. So all of that got done. So big congrats to the mobile web team and the mobile apps team for that. <laughs> On the front end standardization uh, side, we uh, didn't have a lot of specifics, so it's easy for me at this point to declare victory. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, they did a ton of work, which I really want to acknowledge. Um, so. Uh, they built a, uh, so the visual editor team has been working on their library called OJS UI for a long time. Um, and they started to generalize it and make it more useful for other teams. If you click on that link in the slide deck, you'll see a um, sort of a living demo of all the different controls and dialogues. Um, they're responsive, they work on mobile, they work on desktop. And this is a UI library that can be used by any team that's working on user-facing features. And we're starting to uh, use it more broadly. It's now being used within the mobile context. Um, the uh, UX team has been very, working very closely with the front end team to standardize styles, improve the living style guide, and actually apply the new styles to um, MediaWiki core. There's now a demo site that is also in, on that testing link if you want to look at it. Still a lot of stuff to fix, not anywhere near ready for um, public consumption and actual usage in the real world. Um, there's still a lot of inconsistencies and wonkiness to figure out, um, but we're getting closer to, to something that we can at least promote to a beta feature for people to play with. Um, so uh, take a look at that if you want. Um, but generally speaking, it's been really nice to see the little bits of silo effects that we've had over the years around front-end development um, get rectified thanks to the leadership of folks like Trevor Pascal and, and John Robson for um, moving this forward. So thanks to the, the front-end developers and the UX team for their work on this. So the other um, uh, thing that we absolutely uh, said we would deliver and did deliver exactly the way we, we said we would is the editor engagement vital sense dashboard that uh, Kevin is going to show later. You can applaud him when he's going to demo it. Um, the, uh, the stuff that's in yellow, there's a lot here. Um, to me, that's primarily a reflection of just a huge amount of things being declared as top priority. So we're bringing it down to just five in total in the next quarter. So a lot of organizational um, bandwidth that's being dedicated to this. With that being said, uh, I also want to recognize even in a perfectly run uh, engineering organization, some projects are going to be a little bit like playing Minesweeper. You're going to tap something, and there's going to be an explosion, and you don't know how hard it's going to be to fix it. Uh, something you think is taking two months is going to take four months, so you'll never have perfect predictability um, on some of these very complex projects. And sometimes it's also the right thing to push out the timeline to do it correctly. Um, so for instance, with Fabricator, uh, we've been deliberately saying to the team, look, you guys are working on a hugely complex migration of importing like more than 70,000 bugzilla bugs into a new system. If anything goes wrong there, uh, we're going to have hell to pay Let's make sure that we do this right. Uh, let's have lots and lots of testing and lots of attention on this. Take the time you need. Um, so it, it's a mix. I want us to get better around predictability, and I want us to get better around scope. But I also want us to recognize that there is an inherent unpredictability in, in a lot of this work. So if you want to go to details, a lot of the quarterly review slides and decks uh, have been published already, uh, still some of them ongoing, tons of data, tons of facts in there. Thanks a ton to Tillman, who's been working incredibly late hours these last two weeks to work on the minutes and get everything polished and ready. So for Q2, this is the current preliminary list that we worked on. Damon hasn't had a chance to find the light switches yet, so um, still lots to talk through in order to get him up to speed on what all these projects actually mean. 
Um, but um, this is what we've talked about so far at the internal leadership level. So the top priority, um, and in, in that sense, the order actually reflects um, prioritization, um, is uh, really making uh, making progress on trying new contributory models on the mobile web. Uh, so running lots of A-B tests, lots of experiments uh, around things that are not just plain vanilla edits, but contributions to things like Wikidata, um, seeing what works, what doesn't work, what are the signal-to-noise ratios like for different contribution streams that are integrated in the experience. There's going to be lots of failure here. There's going to be lots of testing here until we hit the successes and can double down on those. So really, we have to have a high velocity of just iterating on uh, experiments that we push into production. On the app side of things, apps are still only making up 1% of our readership, that's tiny. Um, so we want to justify and rationalize the effort that we're putting into them. We have to see readership go up. This is also an opportunity for us to really demonstrate what can be done in native code to engage readers and really help them uh, enjoy the experience of Wikipedia on a day-to-day -day basis a lot more. So similar to what we're doing on the mobile web in Appland, we're going to run a lot of tests with things like safe pages, getting these features improved, getting them really solid, um, getting people to come back and uh, again and again to their mobile app sessions and see if we can get the 1% number to go up and to get the session length to be, to, to be higher. Uh, so that work is already in, in, on, underway in uh, the previous quarter and is continuing the next one. On the performance side, we're pretty close to the finish line for HHVM at this point in time. Um, once that project is fully through the woods, um, I expect a lot of the people who've been working on performance engineering will be shifting their attention to work closely with the editing team, um, James Forrester, uh, Rowan Katow, those folks, um, on making the editing pipeline wiki text and visual editor faster for our users specifically, looking at what the performance issues are there, profiling the hell out of it, uh, instrumenting the hell out of it, like getting really, really good data on things like bounce rates, where the performance bottlenecks are, getting some of our best engineers to look into some of the algorithms in Visual Editor and help improve and track down performance bottlenecks. Um, for a quarter uh, that's going to start realistically in November, I expect this is going to be a, a longer ongoing trajectory, especially if you um, account for the holiday period um, in December. On the front-end libraries work, there's still tons and tons of stuff to do here. We have a, an extension right now called Mantle for code sharing between two other extensions. We still have um, jQuery UI dialogues all over the place. Like We have lots of stuff to clean up. We have lots of stuff to standardize. Uh, so that team is going to continue to scope um, and focus its work. Uh, there's a new proposal on the table, which um, has been getting a lot of support from uh, engineering across the org. Um, to put a ton of effort into componentizing uh, MediaWiki course libraries. Basically what this refers to is the software that we use is a huge, gigantic monolith that's hard to work with. It has tons of custom functionality that we've built over the years that is not just of use to us, it's also of use to others. It's difficult to maintain because it's deep, deep, deep inside the code base. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, packaged and purposed in a way that's reusable by third parties. If you click on that link in the deck, uh, there's a first overview on what some of those libraries are that people want to break out. It's going to make our code more maintainable. It's going to reduce technical debt, and it's going to make us a more responsible upstream for downstream users of the technology that we develop. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about elevating this up and giving it some much needed attention. And finally, I still have to call out Fabricator right now just because it is such a high risk migration. I want our eyes to be on the ball on this one. Um, like getting the entire backtracking system moved over to a new infrastructure is risky. It is dangerous. Uh, there's lots of things that can go wrong. We're doing very careful staging. We're doing very careful backups. Uh, lots of people have paid attention to the checklist that Kim have, has developed, but I still want it to be called out until it's done. Um, and uh, in the next quarter, um, we will finally be able to start moving away from a lot of the proprietary project management tools uh, that we're using in the organization, Mingle, Trello, et cetera, into a single standard PM tool um, for most teams. So you see that there's a ton of focus here on developer-related priorities. That's not an accident. Uh, this quarter, we're slowing down on user pushes. Uh, like The big user pushes are one that is completely uncontentious, making things faster. Nobody ever complains about, um, surprisingly. 
And um, mobile, in general, is an environment where we can move with uh, higher velocity and get a lot of stuff done. Um, internally, we want to make our processes really robust, make sure that we have a good handle around our data. Um, that's going to be our execution focus for the next quarter across the board. So what this means to me uh, as a VP of product and strategy is to really focus on making our methodology clear uh, to the world, documenting it and describing it clearly. For instance, we have beta features. What are the criteria for something becoming a beta feature? What are the criteria for something not being a beta feature? When is it in alpha? How do alphas get advertised to whom? When do we get feedback? How do we communicate expectations, set expectations clearly so that when people click on a beta feature, they know that it's going to have bugs, and they expect uh, and know how to report them, and they're invited to do so consistently. What metrics do we use to measure different teams that are trying to hit the same number? Make sure that they use consistent metrics so that we can compare better across the board. Read this through at your leisure. There's a lot of work to, to be done around process, around cross-functional collaboration, and uh, that's going to be a key focus um, for my work. On the Q2 priorities, what we're doing next um, is basically going through every one of them with the folks who are driving and leading them and making sure that we've got the scope right. Uh, I don't want us to overcommit. I want us to undercommit um, and uh, overdeliver at, at the end of the quarter. Uh, so make sure that we are actually um, saying what we think is absolutely achievable and then set some clear stretch goals. Uh, for each project, have the measures defined up front. One thing Lila has pushed us to think about and talk about is to really have one leader, one owner for each one of these top priorities, one person who's accountable, one person who's 100% focused on it, who's driving it, who bags, borrows, and steals resources to get it done um, and who gets the support from the organization to get it done. Um, to really get better at execution, we have to have clear lines of ownership and accountability for projects. So that is something that we're talking about. What does this leadership look like? What support does someone, for instance, who is in a tech lead role and drives the project forward get in terms of project management? So conversations that are ongoing on Office Wiki right now, I encourage you to weigh in um, if you want to be part of that discussion. Um, in terms of how this works relative to the team level planning, we're resourcing the top priorities first, make sure that they are staffed to the level that they need uh, in order to get to be successfully executed. Um, and then we're looking at what, um, what teams can deliver beyond what's committed to at the top priority level. Um, so that's um, the further iteration on, on these priorities. I also want us to get smarter about how the quarterly reviews connect with that because, for instance, we actually didn't have a review system that's lined up with these uh, and we don't have a re review system that's lined up with these right now. Like making sure that the way that we talk through what's being accomplished is aligned with what's committed to. Any questions? Thoughts, comments, reservations, doubts? Now's the time. Not really. And I'm keeping an eye on line too. Sorry, um, a thing that's been on my mind is, um, so we're, we're getting these higher level goals for the entire organization, and I'm just wondering where all the stuff that doesn't fit goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the stuff the rest of us are doing. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is what I was speaking to earlier. So um, that is to me what, it, what I'm talking about in this bulky bullet pond down here, like making sure that as we allocate resources to the success of the top priorities, um, we have a good and rich conversation about what each team is doing. And you have high priorities, and then you have medium priorities, and then you have things that can escalate to high priorities if there's an emergency. So we have to have smart conversations. Um, I think a lot about fundraising tech, as you know, for instance, and making sure that you guys have the, the support that you need in order to support the upcoming fundraiser, but at the same time, we want to be the kind of organization that can execute a fundraiser year after year after year without necessarily having it to be elevated up to this level um, every single year. So it's a balancing act of saying, you know, make sure that all the work that is critical um, has the resources that it needs. I also want us to get better at calendaring. Right now, the roadmap is all over the place. Some things um, have specific dates that are absolutely movable and non-critical, and some things that are critical and have very clear dates and deadlines are not called out as such. So I want us to have a, a clear calendar of stuff that is mission critical that's elevated to the top, and the fundraiser is certainly a perfect example of that. Yeah, I also want us to be a little bit careful. When we say the top five type things, uh, it's uh, 
they're designed to bring attention to some of the big um, big rollout type things. And it might be that the fundraiser should be on that list. It's a negotiation that actually happens uh, at the C level, right? So it might be that Lisa will come to Eric and basically say, hey, Eric, I think this should be here because it's not in the bag or something like that, right? So it's not these things aren't um, aren't just you know made up on the fly. This is this is a conversation that needs to happen. On the other hand, we also need to make sure that uh, when organization runs, there the kind of the the uh, some percentage of resources are allocated to these big audacious goals that need to get done. But the majority of resources actually uh, alloc are actually allocated to making the engine run. Right? It's so kind of think about your car. Right? It's car maintenance. Um, and just because they're not there it doesn't mean that uh, at the individual team level we're not prioritizing them. So this is a very high level priorities, but once they start breaking down, if you look at the actual priority page, each team has their top five, right? And maintenance is definitely part of that. Hope that helps. Okay. So we got to keep moving, but um, this is an ongoing conversation. So please uh, reach out to me, reach out to Damon as you wrap your head around this. Um, and also, as uh, Adam pointed out, we really have to get smart about how we do the team level planning across the organization. So the next presentation is an update on one thing I had called out earlier, which is the work that Gabriel and the services team, which really is Gabriel <laughs> at this point in time. <laughs> Just hurts. Uh, I have been doing on a new API for giving uh, internal and external users access to our content. OK, um, I'm Gabriel. Um, so as Eric said, two thirds of the service team right now, <laughs> apart from Hardik in India. Um, so Lego, everybody likes Lego. The cool thing is it has these well-defined interfaces that let you assemble it in many ways. So it sets up. You can kind of get really creative, build all kinds of things, build on a really small building block. Um, similar idea as a store. It abstracts a lot of the complexities that go into producing books, for example. You can just go there, grab a book from the shelf, um, buy it, and leave. And don't have to worry about all these details. You can get on with your life, do other things. Um, what we've done in the last three months is basically build a book store out of Lego bricks. And it's called RESTBASE. The way you order something is you do a GET request that's using HTTP, which is a very Lego-like protocol. Um, it has a few verbs, and you say what you want. And then it goes off to shelves um, and just looks if it's there. If it's there, it just gives it to you, and that's it. It's really fast. Um, if it's not there, however, it has to order it, just like in a bookstore. Um, in that case, it goes off to some internal service and uh, says, hey, give me uh, the HTML for the Barack Obama page, for example. And once it gets that, that takes a little bit longer, so we want to avoid that if possible. Um, but once it gets back, it gives you the result and also puts it back on the shelf so next requests don't have to go through the same wait again. Um, to minimize uh, the times we have to do this, we have to build big shelves so we can fit a lot of stuff on there, ideally almost everything. Um, the shelf we've chosen so far is called Cassandra. It's a distributed storage system uh, using peer-to-peer -peer algorithms. It distributes uh, all the data across many of these identical bricks. And the way it does that, it looks at the color of each data item and then puts it onto the storage brick that has the closest color. So if we add more bricks with um, all have slightly different colors, each will get a smaller slice of the total data. That makes it very, very scalable. Um, as an added bonus, it also has the capability to um, send data off to other data centers. So there's, uh, we can replicate this data. So if one data center goes down because we lose power, for example, the data is still there and we can keep going. Um, this is currently de only deployed in labs. Uh, there's only one shelf, really, which is for HTML and data parsuit. Um, it's, yeah, you can do a simple request like this. There's no, all the other shelves are still empty, so we want your ideas of what you want to put on the shelves, and um, we've put in a lot of small uh, extension points to add in new shelves for you. Um, even in labs, performance is really good um, because it just doesn't have to do much. It just gets it off the shelf and gives it to you. Um, this is a comparison of rendering it, at the basically going off to the service internally versus 
retrieving it through REST space, and you see it's an order of magnitude difference, even versus HHVM. Um, of course, we can't do this for everything. Oh, it's linear. Seconds, yeah. Um, of course, we can't do this for everything, so some things are still made to order, but we can do a lot of things standardized, industrial scale. This is read-only, yeah. Um, next step is will be to deploy this to production, and we want your idea of what you want to put on the shelves. We have three open engineering positions, so uh, let us know if anybody wants to play with Lego. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and next in the agenda, we have the promised update on the editor dashboards. So let me pull this up. And let's go here. This guy? No. Okay. I can click on it. Do you have to control click or left, right? Okay. Hi, my name is Kevin LaDuke, and I'm a product manager in the analytics team. And I am going to show a demo of our vital signs dashboard. So first of all, what is this? Why did we do it, and for who is it? So. It's a dashboard for decision makers, product managers, grant making, and the community so that they can do analysis on their favorite wikis and look at the health of it, if it's growing, et cetera, and the impact of their features using standardized metrics. So if you click this link on your own free time uh, standardized metrics, you'll see the research defined metrics. So um, before I show you the demo, uh, keep in mind this is the minimum viable product what it means is we developed just enough features for it to be valuable. So there's still a lot of work to do, especially in the user experience, backfilling all the data that we need, and adding more metrics to it. So here's the link. And um, let's just look at the English Wikipedia right now. So I'll click these off. So right now we're looking at the rolling active editors for the English Wikipedia and over the last month, and it's pretty flat. So here you have available at your fingertips 850 different wikis. There's two ways you can search from them. First is by typing Wikipedia, for example. So I want a Wikipedia. There's 200 and some options, and I want the Arabic, or I didn't click Arabic. And these are the active editors for this wiki. Another way to get about it is by choosing a language. And I think earlier we, uh, I heard about the Tamil wiki source. So let's do Tamil. Here's Tamil. There's six projects and wiki source. And these are the active editors. So let me tell you more, a little bit more about the metrics in question now. And I'm going to choose a really interesting project which is commons. So um, the way you add a metric is you click on this blue and uh, let me choose rolling new active editor and rolling surviving active editor. And let's start with rolling active editor. So this is a, a view of all the active editor in the last month. And let's look at the new editors per day. Notice how it jumped up. It practically doubles in September. Do you guys know why? Yes, Wiki loves monuments. And it peaks almost triples compared to the baseline at the last minute. These are all laggers, right? So um, these metrics that I'm showing you are part of what we call the editor model. So the editor model is a way of looking at the editor community through acquisition, activation, and retention. So newly registered is obviously looking at the acquisition of new users. Now activation is the rolling new active editor. So on this day here, um, we have about 3,000 rolling active editors. So that's 3,000 people who created a new account in the last 30 days and made five edits. So not only did they register, we acquired them, they uh, became active. 
So notice there's some lag in here because we're looking at a 30-day window. So it takes a while to, to, it took 30 days to peak. Now for retention, there's a huge drop off. So there's even more lag here. I expect it to go up uh, in account for the September numbers. But here, if we see 40 um, surviving new active editors for the month, these are people who regis registered in August before Wiki loves monuments. So only 40 people who registered in August were active in September. Right? That's that's about 10% of um, the people who who were active. Uh, so, um, yes, question? Sorry. Is there a glossary? Oh, yeah, good point. So these metrics are all defined here. You can click on the link, and it will take you to the definition of these metrics. And now, so these are the, the editor model. We're going to add more metrics. But um, the, the definite focus is when you're adding a feature, you can actually focus on what you're going to impact. So if it's a hackathon, you're going to impact how many new users you're going to get. If you're going to make editing easier, it's going to impact your activation of users. So um, let me go back to the slides. Oh. So the URL is up here. Feel free to check it out. And this is just what we went through. So uh, the technology behind this, there will be a tech talk on Monday. Dan and Nuria will present the technology used to make this dashboard and um, all the problems they faced and why they chose what they chose. And it will be here at noon. And uh, if you have any questions or comments about this, feel free to post them on the analytics mailing list. Thank you very much. I think Kevin has one super quick update on oh, Toby. Toby. Um, Toby, Kevin, same person, different person. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. So, yeah. I'll keep this quick because we're running over. We are uh, releasing uh, mobile page views uh, today, which is super exciting. Um, yeah. Ooh, indeed. Um, <laughs> compose. Uh, yeah, exactly, Zen. Um, Check out the wiki page. We're working with our upstream providers to get this data out to the community. And I think something that is perhaps near and dear to my heart as a, an infrastructure guy, this uses the Hadoop, Hadoop infrastructure that we've been working on for many years. It's a very small piece of functionality, but it represents a lot of work from tech ops, from the analytics development team, and uh, even legal as well. So uh, I'm going to blog about this, but anyway, it's, um, it's a happy day for the analytics team. It's real quick, and this is like just to highlight this. I've asked them at the beginning of the quarter to uh, to get some of these metrics in. I had no hope that they would get it done. Uh, so I am really impressed. So thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Toby. All right, I'm not going to give um, Yuri the floor because he will not stop talking if I do. Uh, <laughs> but um, if you want to take a look um, on, on the agenda, there's a link to the graph extension, which he's been working on and has been making some noise on the wikis about to um, get people to test and play with. Um, it's a very cool project that came out of the work uh, Yuri uh, has been doing with the Wikipedia Zero team in order to give them better uh, tools to visualize data. Um, that relates to Wikipedia Zero usage, but it is generalized in such a way that it could potentially become a tool for our communities much more broadly. It still needs a fair bit of work to get there, and there's no team or timeline attached to it at this point in time. But if you want to play with it, uh, follow the link. It is very powerful stuff. Uh, 
And it is based on a lot of work that also Arden Andrescu from the analytics engineering team has been doing. Thank you for standing next to me, Toby. Uh, Eric, can you scroll down a little bit just to show people what, uh, what it does? It just visualizes the edits in a very, um, very easy to understand way, contributions. Um, so if you look at kind of the contributions history page, um, this uh, this can show it to you as a graph, which is really really cool. Yeah. So so the the only hesitation that I have um, to not just push this forward is that these are JavaScript generated graphs, and, and we do have to support uh, readers and users without JavaScript. So a big dependency to make this useful for our project is to have like static versions of these graphs that we can generate for our articles, and that is uh, definitely something that Yuri has been trying to think about and look into. Um, but as far as like uh, using it right now and playing with it in a specific context. Um, on, do take a look. It is deployed on Meta and MediaWiki.org, so the grant making team could actually potentially be using it for stuff that they're doing on Meta today. Hey, Eric. Before we end, can you move back to the October welcome slides because we have anniversaries, and I just want to leave that up there as we All move right. into um, completionist our uh, lunch period. Um, because we have a lot of anniversaries to celebrate, and we have cupcakes to celebrate them with. We. I mean, look at that. And that closes the metrics meeting for the day. Thank you, everyone. All right.